My name is Dr. Ivy Brennan. I'm a naturopathic doctor in New York City. My practice is Simplicity Health Associates. And now that we're much more in the virtual age, yes, I'm based in New York City, but I'm actually working with patients all over the world, all over the States, uh, virtually. And today I'm really excited to be having a discussion that I've been like really wanting to have with my friend and acupuncturist, Anora Chang. And we're gonna be talking all about menopause. And we're gonna be talking about kind of like two different perspectives on a natural approach and how they can work together, but how they're a little bit different. And so I'm really excited to have this conversation. We actually, we got together, when was it, Anora? Was it last month? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's been like a month already. Yeah, definitely, August. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, 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 were, we were having a conversation and then I started picking Anora's brain all about menopause because menopause is something I see very often in my practice. And I was really just curious about what, what, um, acupuncture and Chinese herbs has to offer and what is the, the approach because often when um, patients come to my practice or when I'm meeting people and I'm talking about naturopathic medicine, the, the common misconception is that naturopathic medicine is Eastern when it's actually a more of a, a natural Western approach. So one of the things I wanted to just start off with, uh, and Nora, maybe talk a little bit about how does ch traditional Chinese medicine view menopause and, and, and kind of like how sort of um, the, the different organ systems and how they kind of relate? Because um, one of the things also with the Eastern approach or the Chinese medicine approach is that um, organs have sort of a little bit of a different characteristic than how we view it in, in more of a Western uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So um, with menopause, the main organ system that is looked at is are the kidneys, because in Chinese medicine, a big function of the kidneys is that it governs reproduction and, you know, reproductive health. So of course, once women hit menopause, um, the kidneys are definitely affected and um, it would be some sort of deficiency in the kidneys. Um, and it would be either, you know, there's the yin and the yang aspect. So it could be, you know, kidney yin deficiency, kidney yang deficiency, it could be both, but in some way the kidneys are involved. Um, and on top of that, there are other organ systems that are also connected, you know, of course, everything is connected, but the major one would also be the heart because the heart has a connection to the kidneys and um, also the liver and spleen because they have a lot to do with blood. So, um, so if somebody came in to me and you know, was complaining about menopause symptoms, for sure I would know there's a kidney deficiency going on. And then on top of that, it would be de depend on the individual and how they're presenting and then the other organ systems could be involved. Okay, so it's interesting. So sort of very much associated with the kidneys, so not the ovaries, not the uterus. No. Like from a Chinese medicine perspective, organs don't necessarily have like the same like physiological function that we view it in, in Western medicine. Is that right? Right. That's that's correct. I mean, there is some overlap because like in Chinese medicine, the kidneys also have a lot to do with like urination and it's paired with like the urinary bladder. So there is some overlap, but it's not like a this equals this. It's not that neat. And there and the um, organ systems do have functions that are just very unique to the way Chinese medicine views it. It'd be completely foreign to like a Western doctor you know, if you tell them, well, the kidneys do this and, you know, the heart and lungs do this, it would, yeah, it's, there's no um, equivalency in Western medicine. No question. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like my brain is fired up. So with menopause, it being very much a factor of the kidneys. Now with other like menstrual, like for example, um, amenorrhea, which is lack of a period, um, mm -hmm. with a non-menopausal um, origin, would that also be related to kidney dysfunction or would you be actually kind of considering 
a different system altogether. For um, if lack of menstruation, <clears throat> I would look first to the spleen because in Chinese medicine, the spleen is um, a major organ for producing blood. So if you're not having your monthly cycle, there's like some sort of blood deficiency or something's going on um, in that area. So I would look to the spleen first, but the kidneys, there could be some underlying kidney deficiency because also in Chinese medicine, the kidneys are kind of like the root of everything, the root of yin and yang. Hmm. <clears throat> but um, for like, yeah, but for amenorrhea, I would definitely look to the spleen first and see what's going on there. You know, Oscar, I'm like, yeah, I'm like really fascinated. <laughs> so, because uh, I think I told you, I took, I mean, I took like one uh, TCM class that we were like, mm -hmm. had to take and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I don't know if it was in my TCM class or, or a shift I was on that uh, estrogen is considered like a yin hormone or like it's related to yin. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Estrogen would be considered, I would say it's like a yin factor. Right. You know, and when I, and when we talk about yin in Chinese medicine, it's all about like yin factors like cool they moisten they're the opposite of yang which are which is like drying and warming so like blood is also a yin factor um because it's you know it's moist it nourishes like the yin aspect nourishes moistens cools <clears throat> um, things in the body so yeah and then yang so would you like i'm, I'm is yang like a, like a testosterone? Like is, is testosterone, would you say, like a, a yang hormone kind of, or? Um, I would be, yeah, I would say like, yeah, testosterone is more yang because of the function. Um, and, it, and also like things that could be like yin, like fluids are considered yin, but everything can be then divided into yin and yang, right? So, um, so yeah, so testosterone, I would definitely say is young because it's, um, because of the functions. Well, the reason why, like, like I'm really excited about this, I know again, like mm -hmm. the organ systems are very different from like a Western Eastern perspective, but when we think about menopause, like pathophysiology on a, like more of a Western, like how the different organs function. So basically what is happening is that um, hormones are being less produced by the ovaries because uh, the woman mm -hmm. is no longer producing eggs, is no longer ovulating, but she still is producing hormones, but she's more now predominantly producing her hormones on, from her adrenal glands. And why mm -hmm. I find this so fascinating from, what you're, your, from your perspective is that the adrenal glands are basically on top of the kidneys. And right. so and when, when you're thinking, when I'm thinking like yin and yang deficiency of the kidneys, and so I was like asking you about like estrogen and testosterone, those are two hormones that we're often, um, or at least what I'm looking for when I'm working with a woman who is going through menopause and how well her adrenal glands are taking over from the lack of what's happening in, in the ovary. So I just find that- mm -hmm even though it is like different, that there is like- Right, there is some sort of relationship that kind of makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so I have a question for you. Yeah, sure. So when you're seeing a patient and you're diagnosing, so do you are always looking at the hormone levels, so you're looking at their lab results and that's kind of how you decide on treatment plan? Well, so there's a couple of factors. So definitely if I have a woman who is having irregular cycles or not getting her cycle and she's past a certain age, so past like 45, um, I start thinking possibly this woman might be going into perimenopause uh, versus um, other, like how we were talking about like amenorrhea due to other mm -hmm. factors, which again, for people, sorry, I tend to use like very high language, um, which just means lack of a period. Uh, so one of the things I will want her to do is definitely get hormones tested, specifically looking at uh, follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, because if that's very elevated, even if say, for example, um, her estrogen, which we would test as estradiol, um, 
is quote unquote at a normal range. If her FSH is very, very elevated, like over 20, then it's highly suspect that she's actually going through menopause. So I find it, it's, it, it's good information for me because then I know what I need to be doing with this woman. So, if, so, for, so irregular cycles due to other causes, rule them out. And okay, this is a menopause picture. What are her key symptoms? And then we can even go even deeper and looking even at some other aspects of her hormones. Um, Cause sometimes specifically it, depending if I'm requesting labs or she's already had the labs, um, maybe she hasn't had her testosterone tested. Cause specifically with like um, when a woman is having um, like problems with libido, it could be estrogen, but it also could be low levels of testosterone. Or the other thing is um, she might be having very elevated testosterone relative to her other hormones. And then she's having issues of maybe she's having facial hair, she's having hair loss, um, having acne again, and she's very surprised about that. And so it, it's important information for me. So I know the best course of action for, for the patient. Okay. Oh, I have another question. Yeah. Um, so in Chinese medicine, um, a lot of the way we diagnose is like we ask a lot of questions. Like we don't really rely so much on lab results, although, you know, that's that's always helpful. But since we kind of diagnose from our own, you know, perspective, so we ask a lot of questions on their symptoms and everything like that. Is that something you also do and that will kind of narrow down your diagnosis and treatment plan? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, I'm definitely mm -hmm. asking a lot of, again, like, what are some of the symptoms? Also, it's helpful for me, not even just from the, the diagnosis standpoint, but also knowing what are the symptoms that are bothering this patient mm -hmm. and also help us know if we're moving in the right direction with treatment. And also because the labs, they tell us something, but they don't tell us the whole picture either. And it's possible to have a woman have abnormal labs and her not have a lot of symptoms. And then another patient has um, not um, so off labs and she's experiencing more symptoms than someone else. So it's, it's definitely something I use at least um, in the choice of herbs or if in case like, um, for example, if it's a very young woman and it is revealed that she is going through premature ovarian failure, um, it might make sense for this woman to do hormone replacement therapy. Now, I don't prescribe it, but I might um, encourage her to follow up with her gynecologist uh, to get that on board. Okay. So, oh, so is there, would there be any type of like herbs or supplements you use that work similar to hormone replacement therapy or, or no? I mean, could they, if they didn't want to do hormone replacement therapy, couldn't you like offer a different approach that, you know, that may work as well? Oh yeah. So absolutely. I mean, the only, again, like if it's a very young woman who's going through mm -hmm. or ovarian failure, um, I will give her supportive herbs to help her hopefully get preserve more cycling, but she probably will need to at some point go on hormone replacement therapy for a certain period of time um, just to kind of get her just more from a, a bone health and a cardiovascular health. But most mm -hmm. other women who are going through menopause, like in quote unquote, like normal age, like over the age of 45, don't necessarily need hormone replacement therapy. Though, of course, I'm always, I try to support my patients with whatever options that they're looking for. And so for patients that aren't wanting hormone replacement therapy or they wanna try something natural first, there are some herbs that we use to help um, with certain hormones. So um, from like an estrogen standpoint, um, my go-to herb is maca. And I find it works actually relatively quickly, actually within a few weeks, which is really nice. And it helps with hot flashes. It ha helps with uh, memory, mood stabilization, uh, vaginal dryness. And, and typically we can even see, again, like results in a few weeks. Um, the form I prefer is gelatinized because it's more bioavailable. So the 
if you're just getting like the maca powder that you put in your smoothie, um, you're probably not gonna get the same results. Also black cohosh is also a really good phytoestrogen and also um, plain Jane ground flax can really help a lot. So those are kind of like my, oh, and, and then there's some other herbs that are not as common or people might not know it so much about hops. It's a really powerful mm -hmm. phytoestrogen specifically um, when there's sleep issues because it, it has like a slight uh, nervine effect. So those are kind of like my estrogen kind of go-tos. And then, you know, it's interesting just um, earlier today, I had one of my perimenopausal patients and her period actually started up again, which one of the things um, in, in you, you probably have witnessed in this in your practice as well, uh, often during that um, perimenopausal period, uh, women experience more frequent periods, longer periods, and that all has to do with um, a decrease in progesterone. So often what's happening is these women, um, because they're not necessarily regularly ovulating, and it's really ovulation that kicks off the production of progesterone. So these women are going to need some additional support with progesterone. And so um, probably the number one herb for that would be Vitex or Chase Tree. Uh, and then uh, another mm -hmm. one, which you're probably familiar with is peony, white peony, mm -hmm. really helpful with progesterone, diascorea. Uh, and then sometimes, um, well, maybe I won't get so much into the, um, the precursors, but there are some kind of precursor type hormones, I call them, um, basically pregnenolone and DHEA. So pregnenolone is sort of like this parent hormone that, um, is broken down on, on both sides. Uh, it can become progesterone, it can become estrogen. So sometimes these women might benefit from that or even doing um, a topical progesterone cream. Uh, and then the other uh, DHEA, though DHEA, I'm, I'm, it, I have seen it work well, but I'm always a little hesitant to prescribe it. And if I do prescribe it, I tend to prescribe it pretty low because of some of the uh, side effects. So it is, um, has androgen properties. So androgen being like male hormone. Uh, mm -hmm. So some women can experience things like acne or um, some changes that they don't really care for. So I'm, I'm very careful. I usually only prescribe that if I know for sure that um, the DHEA level is low, otherwise they might have the side effects. And then the last being, um, so testosterone. So testosterone either being too high or too low, causing um, specifically sexual type side effects. Um, so ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is a great herb specifically when you're wanting to support the increase, but I'm very cautious of prescribing ashwagandha if I know that there is uh, too much testosterone, uh, but ashwagandha in general can be really good, helpful for, for sleep. And again, if we're thinking about um, uh, adrenal health, um, it's really good for supporting the adrenal glands. And then on the opposite end, um, things like nettles, um, saw palmetto, pygium, all of these herbs can really help if there is sort of a little bit too much uh, testosterone relative to the other hormones and it's causing some other issues. Though actually, to be honest, um, when it comes to too much testosterone, um, yes, herbs are really helpful, but often it's a factor of insulin resistant and metabolic disorders. So I'm usually much more focused on dietary interventions to help to bring that down. Though, again, sometimes um, having some herbs can be also really helpful. Okay. So one of the things um, I was also kind of like sort of curious about too was, um, so, what, like when you, you get a menopausal patient in, uh, and so talk, talk through again, so, you know, looking at the tongue, like I always like, I'm always just so fascinated about the diagnostic strategy and like how you kind of come up with, like from diagnosis to mm -hmm. treatment strategy, both using um, like maybe some of the key acupuncture points and, and some of the key uh, herbal formulas. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. So um, when I'm diagnosing a patient, like 
we do a lot of um, questions to see, you know, what kind of symptoms they're feeling and where they're feeling them in their body. Um, and then I will look at their tongue and I'm looking at the shape, the color, the coating. Um, and usually in somebody with a classic menopausal tongue, it'll be red indicating some heat if they're having night sweats it'll be dry because of course there's like a lack of um, the moisturizing kind of aspect of their body it can also be like narrow or small mm. um, so uh, I would look at the tongue and that would tell me you know just kind of like how much heat there is in the body and then of course you feel the pulses on both sides of the wrists and um, they correspond to the different organs so again, there you will probably pick up the kidney pulse is weaker, possibly the heart pulse might be a little soft. So, um, and then from there, um, like say I'm seeing a real strong kidney pattern or, or a deficiency in the kidney pattern, then I would most likely go to the kidney meridian and choose the points on the meridian that would uh, supplement the kidneys, especially maybe the kidney yin aspect. Um, I may choose something on the spleen meridian just to like boost blood, which is also a yin factor. And then, you know, depending on, you know, sometimes I have women that say when they have like hot flashes, they feel it on the back of their neck, or sometimes they'll say like it's on my head. Um, and then if, if that's the case, then I'll look at the meridian and I'll choose the meridian that travels to that area of the body. So if somebody's saying the back of their neck is always sweating, but everything else feels fine, then I would look at the bladder meridian. If they say like their forehead is always hot, you know, then I would look at the stomach channel. So yeah, so there's a couple of different ways that you can treat, but um, that the kidney meridian would always be involved. And then how often, so like, like from like a, I haven't asked about this. Um, so like when you have a patient and you're, you're working with them via acupuncture, um, you know, how often are they seeing you and, and how long does it take to get results? And, and is it, um, is there a maintenance involved? Mm -hmm. Sure. So it depends on how intense the symptoms are. Like if they're very intense, I would recommend uh, twice a week acupuncture treatments to start. Um, I usually just start with acupuncture to see how they respond. And then if they're willing to take herbs, I recommend doing acupuncture and herbs together. Um, however, you know, the herbs don't ever taste that great. So um, that's the big part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like if the patient is not going to take their herbs daily, then, you know, then we'll just have to use acupuncture. But the, um, the most effective way to address uh, menopause would be acupuncture and herbs. And I would start maybe like a, couple, a few weeks, twice, twice a week, if they're very intense, like hot flashes, night sweats. Um, and then we taper down to once a week once we get the symptoms under control. And um, then to every other week, and if they're taking herbs, they can do acupuncture one week. They're taking their herbs, so their herbs will fill in for the following week. They don't have to come from acu for acupuncture. And then um, gradually, we just um, space out the treatments. And if they're interested in maintenance, you know, uh, I would say four to eight weeks, they could come for just like a tune-up. And um, as far as acupuncture, that can, that's pretty effective and can work pretty quickly. It can um, make a difference that day or within the next few days, but it will be a temporary relief of um, the symptoms. Like the symptoms will probably still be there, but they won't be as intense or, you know, maybe that night, that evening, they'll feel much better, but the next day or the day after, it, it might go back to what they were experiencing before. So, um, so it is like a cumulative kind of process before they kind of get to some sort of kind of consistent difference mm. where, where the symptoms are under control and they're feeling better consistently. Um, how about with, um, with naturopathic approach? Like how long, is it usually take a few weeks that they're on these herbs that they start to notice something different? Right, so 
again, every patient is a little bit different in, in how they respond. And it's a, a it's a couple of things. It's one, definitely making sure that we have like the right formula and based on what we know about the patient. Uh, so when I was talking about, so maca definitely we see a pretty good response. Uh, typically I would usually, so it's a mixture. Um, so I don't normally just prescribe herbs. I'm usually doing other things as well. Um, definitely um, giving specific nutrients. So it, it, for example, even talk a little bit about this patient I saw earlier, uh, of course, we just adjusted her plan. So we'll see how she does. Uh, one of the things that she, cause now she's sort of in getting her period back or, or, or like a bow period, I guess you would say, cause it's mostly probably uh, breakthrough bleeding at this point. And with the fluctuation in hormones, she's experiencing a lot of mood like symptoms. And so like from my, my toolbox, a lot of that, it, it, it's basically the same mechanism as mm -hmm. women would normally experience during PMS. And basically, because the woman is experiencing these problems or these symptoms due to the, the drop in hormones. And so one of the key factors for her is going to make sure that she's having enough B6. And B6 typically usually takes about a month to see a change, but that can really, really help with mood. And so one of the things I'm hoping with her now that we've gotten the Vitex on and the B6 that in a month, she shouldn't have like this, this dramatic um, shift in her mood. So that's like definitely a big factor. Um, the other factors I would also say is, um, because I'm also, um, so a lot of these menopausal patients, it's definitely, it's, you know, the hot flashes, but some of the other, like the sexual side effects, the mood, the energy, um, the weight, weight issues. The other thing that I'm also kind of concerned with, with those issues is also looking at thyroid because thyroid function can definitely change uh, during menopause. And so that might be something that we also have to address whether they want to um, work on the thyroid naturally, or again, um, I'm never, I, I never oppose the patient from trying other things. So they might benefit from taking some um, thyroid medication, which they would get from an endocrinologist. But basically, once we really get the proper steps in place, they should definitely be feeling um, a lot better even by the next appointment, which I, I tend to usually just see my patients um, on a monthly basis. So that's mm -hmm. kind of some of the things that they can expect. And of course, for women watching this, um, when we're thinking about menopause, we're really thinking about more like the menopausal period, the, the perimenopausal period, that a lot of these symptoms should over time go away. And one of the big things that I'm now looking at, like when I'm working with a patient who's going through the change, yes, supporting them through the change, but also making sure that other systems like cardiovascular health, bone health, and, and that that also has to definitely be addressed. And like another factor, which I, I also didn't really mention, um, is probiotics and the microbiome and, and how that can shift due to perimenopause and menopause and, and seeing a lot more women getting more urinary tract infections, mm -hmm. sexual diagnosis. And a lot of this has to do with a shift in the vaginal flora. And so that's another thing that I do address with these patients. And one aspect is, is dietary changes that are gonna really support healthy vaginal flora, but also making sure that they're on the right probiotic. And sometimes we'll even have to do a period of um, vaginal probiotic, like, um, like actually inserting the uh, probiotic vaginally just to make sure that, they're, um, that we really increase those levels, also giving them specific nutrients to support the vaginal lining, which is going to, Unfortunately, everything is going to start thinning once estrogen and testosterone decide to like decrease. They don't necessarily go away, but they dramatically decrease. So that is going to have an effect on all, um, basically all our skin, all our, everything, kind of, all the connective tissue is going to have. Um, so the supporting healthy connective tissue is, is really important in the absence of adequate hormone levels. I have a question. So if you want to prescribe like the supplements, the nutrients, um, do you usually have them take them for a month 
and then if you wanted to adjust it, it would be after they've been on that particular formula for a month, or do you, or is it kind of like a week to week? Um, um, you check in, it would adjust it, or okay. So it's definitely so I have patients definitely stay on any regimen for at least a month. Um, mm -hmm. I do have, so when I'm first starting to work with a patient, I usually will, well, not usually, I always do. I check in with them the week after basically mm -hmm. for whatever reason, my practice definitely tends to attract very sensitive patients. So sometimes we need to, I, I try to be very conservative with my dosing and I'll often even have patients build themselves up, but there have been times where we have to lower the dose. Um, so like maca, for example, because it does have like a very stimulating quality to it. Uh, I tend to, unless it really makes sense to, um, I usually will dose it on the lower end and then at their follow-up, um, if their symptoms aren't really improving, then I will increase it. And sometimes it's also not even about um, increasing or lowering the doses, but also changing the way that the patient takes certain herbs or nutrients that they might might work better for them. Okay. Uh, so what are the different ways they can take the herbs? Like in capsule form or do they? Oh yeah, so um, so it's like almost like the same predicament that I have as well or that you have. Um, patients don't like, which I, I don't know if it's like, because I went through naturopathic school, I'm able to, to to take some really dank stuff. And I have <laughs> taken some of the dankest um, Chinese formulas where, I mean, I had to do the own like, um, cause I don't know if that's also a compliance issue with you as well. Um, cause I actually, like I had to go to Camwo or it's called Camwo. Uh -huh. And I got like, right. the and like I had to make it myself. So it's like, I had to take the, took like, I think like 30 minutes to drink something that tastes horrendous, but it really worked. Um, so that is always like definitely a challenge either. Um, I, I, I will attract patients that can't take capsules. So we have to um, find powder or liquid or chewables. And then of course, like the powders and chewables, sometimes they don't taste good or they might have um, other ingredients in them to try to make them taste good, but they're not, but they're problematic. Um, so, and then my, ideally I, I, First of all, I don't like to give patients too many things. So mm -hmm. you know, the unfortunate reality is that um, a lot of patients want to get better sooner and uh, lifestyle changes can be difficult. So sometimes we do need to supplement pretty heavily in the beginning. Um, but I really try to be mindful of like the different forms and like I, I would prefer not so many capsules. Um, capsules is usually my choice over tablets and, and there's specific brands I like that have less um, other like inactive ingredients because that's mm -hmm. something I'm always like, I don't want my patients taking too much like um, silicon oxide or and um, magnesium stearate and some of these um, other inactive ingredients that are in, in the supplements. And, and then also you always have to be mindful of water intake and making sure that they're getting enough water when they're, they're increasing supplements because um, often headaches related to supplements usually are a sign of, of dehydration and needing more liquids when you're taking supplements. So it's always like, that's always like a, a new strategy with, with every patient is finding what's gonna work for them, but also that's gonna get them the results that they have. And, and I'm assuming with, cause I know with like, for example, like some of the tinctures that I prescribe, so tinctures are, um, alcohol herb preparations, which I, I personally actually wish all my patients would take because mm -hmm. I feel like that's such a great delivery system, um, but a lot of them don't taste so great, but you can mix them with juice, though again, like I'm not like a big fan of juice in general, but um, if it's, you know, four ounces of juice to four ounces of water with the, um, with the tincture, it's not probably going to cause too much of a uh, insulin blood sugar imbalance, but that's like one approach that I might have. Um, also, I, I do like teas, but again, that can be sometimes, um, hate to say, time consuming, but you probably already have experienced that with New Yorkers. Like, I don't know, with Chinese herbs, is it even possible to, 
because because I, I think that they always have to be at least I think Chinese herbs have to be taken on an empty stomach, correct? And that um, no, not necessarily. Okay. No, they can be taken like after a meal. Yeah, yeah. So like um like I know it depends on the person, but kind of on average, like how many supplements and and nutrients do you generally prescribe? I, I yeah, I mean it definitely varies. Um, right. So let's see. Like is it like three or five or two? I mean, I'd say it ranges, it's almost like it ranges from like zero. So I have uh -huh. some things like um that we just don't do supplements with um, mm -hmm. for various reasons. So I'd say it's anywhere from zero, I hate to say 10, um, mm -hmm. but usually a patient is like, so like I have some protocols that um, for a certain period of time, the patient has to be on a lot of different things. Like I see this a lot with like, um, I work with HPV, cervical dysplasia, those patients have to be on quite a few supplements for a period of time. Also um, small intestinal, like any kind of like where I'm trying to like eradicate um, some kind of imbalance. So whether it's a patient who has chronic uh, bacterial vaginosis, chronic yeast infections, they're going to have to be on a, a pretty extensive, usually a protocol like that, probably um, they're going to be on quite a few things, but it's only for about one to two months. Um, mm -hmm. Only with a patient who has SIBO. But then I, like for like a, most patients, I'd say on average, or like most people in general would benefit from taking a good multi, uh, taking a, a probiotic and taking an, an omega, whether it's fish derived or or algae derived, um, and then like with the and then certain specific nutrients. Sometimes I mean I do have a lot of women who are deficient in iron, and so they need iron supplementation for a period of time. Specifically, if they're not able to get um, adequate from from their diet for various reasons. Also, magnesium is like one of my favorite things to prescribe. Mm -hmm. uh, it really helps with so many things from stress and sleep and and muscle aches. Okay, uh, that's that's interesting because generally, if I prescribe a formula, it's usually one because within the formula there could be several herbs. Um, but yeah, okay. Well, because I think like maybe that's like like I feel like because. Well, one, I, I know that um, like Eastern, like the formulation is like very different and it's almost like everything is kind of like working together as one where mm -hmm. with more like the um, Western approach is we're looking at different systems themselves. And so kind of like each thing is kind of like giving like, we're, so like with the menopausal patient, it's often, I am probably going to be addressing her adrenals in some way because again like that's what really needs to be nourished then um some herbs that are going to be much more um like symptom based which mm -hmm. kind of treat maca sort of both because it, it it does support the adrenals and does support the hormones but also has like um the symptoms and then again like looking at any possible uh deficiency also like their um their own personal health history and if like they have any risk factors for anything that needs to be addressed like this patient I was speaking about earlier she also has Hashimoto's uh, which is a type of hypothyroidism so that's also a factor that uh, that needs to be addressed and so she really needs to be on like a specific multi that's going to really help multivitamin which is going to help her but one of the things I'll have to say is that when I do have a, a patient that I'm treating for any kind of, who's coming to see me for any hormonal imbalance, if I already know that they're on a Chinese formula, like an herbal formula, um, I usually will not prescribe uh, Western herbs unless I try not to, to do too many herbs at once. Cause I, I, I understand like how, like not that I completely understand how, um, Chinese formulas work, but I tend to usually will just have that. And I've also found everyone is so different. I, I, I definitely have found some patients really respond really well to Western herbs, whereas other patients really respond a lot better to TCM herbs. And I'm actually one of those people. I respond, I don't really take a lot of Western herbs. Um, most of the formulas that have really helped me from an herbal standpoint were actually 
prescribed by actually, well, Nora, you prescribed me, um, <laughs> but, um, but not just you, but I've had um, other acupuncturists. Right. Uh, so I feel like, I think everybody's body is so different. So that's where mm-hmm. I think that they really can work together. So whether it's the patient is doing herbs and acupuncture with their acupuncturist, and then they're seeing me more for like the nutrition, the nutrient base, maybe some neurotransmitters, maybe also doing uh, some some testing. I think that they really do work well together. I agree. Yeah. And um, yeah, I agree with you. Like if I have somebody who's taking a lot of Western supplements or nutrients, I definitely won't, I'm not going to prescribe an herbal formula on top of it, but then I can um, use acupuncture to kind of support whatever, you know, the herbs and supplements that they're taking. So I, I agree with you that I feel like they can really complement each other. And it is true that people respond differently. And some people it's like, they respond so much better to Western herbs and some people like the Chinese formulas really work for them. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Totally. I know we don't have that much time, but like I, we've talked about this before and that's like, that's like so off topic with menopause, but um, so Anora is like my go-to person when my patients come with these like bottles of these like Chinese formulas. I'm like, I don't know what this is. And they didn't get it from somebody. They found it like on a website somewhere. Um, maybe talk a little bit about like, I think it's really important specifically with, cause like I, you know, sometimes I get tempted cause like I know a little bit about some of the Chinese formulas, but again, like I'm not a TCM practitioner so I wouldn't prescribe that. So maybe mm-hmm. talk a little bit about the dangers of like self-prescribing um, Chinese formulas and being like, you know, mindful of, because I, I had showed you that website, the last, I'm not going to, I don't remember the name of it, that that patient had bought all these products and you're like, this is like, not like, yeah, this. I have to say, yeah, like whenever somebody comes to me and says, you know, oh, you know, I'm taking this and it's just this general women's health formula. It's like when I look at the ingredients, like I may recognize some of the herbs as Chinese herbs, but it's just, it's just way too general. And I think we both treat like in a very individualistic way where it's specific and unique to that person and how that person's presenting. So in in Chinese medicine, there are hundreds of formulas and I can say all the formulas I've seen out there, they're not a classical formula. They're not a traditional Chinese herbal formula. So, um, and I can tell anybody who's taking that it was not prescribed by an herbalist or an acupuncturist because um, a Chinese herbalist would have been much more specific to identify their pattern and their symptoms and to really address those patterns and symptoms. And, um, and if they wanted to modify one of those classical formulas, they can certainly do that, but it wouldn't be such a general formula just to address like women's health or, or you know, menopausal symptom or menopause health, health. It's not gonna be something that general. So to me, it's not worth it. To me, it's like better to go to either someone like you, a naturopathic doctor that can you know, really pinpoint what's going on and prescribe something that's uh, specific to them or to go to an acupuncturist and herbalist like me and I'll look at it from my lens and prescribe something far more individualized and unique for, for the way they're presenting. So, so yeah, so <laughs> I'm not a fan. <laughs> Yeah, those websites or those formulas, you know, it's like they take the general idea from a Chinese formula, you know, but it's, it's not really addressing anything specific. Right. And it's interesting because I get, I mean, then I get like Western formulas or these like different, there's so many like new like supplement like companies or whatever, and they're very flashy and they have like, I guess, like automatic subscribing and they're, they're really, um, But when you look at some of the things, it's like, yes, um, this herb does treat X, but not in your case. So I see that Mm -hmm. very, very often. And specifically because I'm like Vitex, which is a great herb, 
um, isn't appropriate for, first of all, all types of menopause, all types of um, PMS. So just because you like you can like search and it comes up doesn't necessarily mean that that herb is for you. And then the other big thing, and, and, and you probably also have come across this, is product quality. Like if I don't know the brand and I don't know, I don't know where they sourced it. I don't know what the quality mm-hmm. is. You don't even, the scary thing is like, and um, cause I'm a, I think I told you like I'm a big uh, PubMed geek and I like to look up things on PubMed and which uh, for people watching this is a, like a search engine to find um, different different medical studies on, on not just herbs, but you know, pharmaceuticals as well. Um, very often, you will come across like, oh, that some herb is like, you know, hepatic toxic, it's like toxic to liver. But if you actually look at the study that it, it was um, like contaminated or it wasn't the real herb. And so it's, it's just bad, just so terrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I guess like with Western medicine, like they definitely kind of treat the disease so if menopause is the disease, or kind, there's kind of just kind of one approach, or maybe two, and everybody who comes in with menopause is prescribed, you know, that treatment. Whereas with you and I, we look at the individual patterns. So even though they're coming in with the same disease, their underlying, you know, pattern could be very different. So that leads to a different treatment in our eyes. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, it's so hard. Like when you like meet people and they ask you oh what do you do for menopause or what do you do that or what and like Mm -hmm. wow okay you have five hours (laughs) right it's like well it depends you know (laughs) like two people with coming in with menopause could have pretty different treatment strategies yeah well this has been really great and Nora and it's interesting like yes we have a different approach but we also have like the same approach that's different uh and hopefully people watching this have a better understanding both of like what a naturopath does and also what an acupuncturist who does um, traditional Chinese medicine. We didn't get to talk about the diet, but maybe some other time I'll have you back on. And so this has been really great. So Anora, how can people get in touch with you? Oh, sure. So um, I can be reached at internalharmonynyc.com. Um, that has all my contact information. Uh, email address is Enora at internalharmonynyc.com. Uh, so yeah, you can find me there. And everyone, Thank thanks Enora. And everyone, I'm Dr. Ivy Brandon. I'm a naturopathic doctor based in New York, but working with everyone all over the world. My practice is Simplicity Health Associates. Um, today is Oh my goodness, September 14th, right? September 14th, 14th. yes. <laughs> September 14th, 2021. And uh, this weekend on Sunday, I'm going to be on a menopause panel for an organization for um, Mother Later. It's all going to be on menopause. So I'm really excited to be on that panel. And if you liked what you saw, uh, I definitely encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And of course, you can always find me at simplicityhealthassociates.com or on Instagram. And everyone, have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye, everyone.